Our first scripture reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 10, verses 30 through 43, and it be, can be found on page 1004 of your pew Bible. Some of my best readers are not here today, so we're going to have to step it up, guys. Page 1004. When you have it, say amen. If you're still looking, say, oh, Lord. That oh, sounds like the amens are outweighing the old Lord, so we can go. <clears throat> the word reads as follows. Cornelius replied, four days ago at this very hour at three o'clock, I was praying in my house when suddenly a man in dazzling clothes stood before me. He said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa, and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying in the home of Simon, a tanner by the sea. Therefore, I sent for you immediately, and you have been kind enough to come. So now all of us are here in the presence of God to listen to all that the Lord has commanded you to say. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power how he went about doing good and healing all who are oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Amen. Our next reading this morning is from the book of Galatians, chapter 3, it can be found on page 1063. We will be reading on page 1063, at the bottom of the left column, we're starting right there at verse 23, reading to 29, which is the end of the chapter. Everybody have it? Amen. Now, before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian, for in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one, in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. All things being equal. Anybody ever heard that expression before? It's actually one of my favorite expressions because it does not mean what it sounds like it means. All things being equal. But what does it really mean when someone says all things being equal? Well, let's see if we can explore this a little bit. It's used to say what would happen or be true if two situations, two products, or two of anything are different in a specified way, but the same in other ways. That's really clear, right? They're the same in one way, but different in other ways? Yeah, that's really clear. So to give you an example, I could say, 
all things being equal, a person with a PhD should be getting a higher salary than somebody who only has a master's degree. Okay, does that make sense? It should, right? Somebody with a doctorate should be making more money than somebody who has only a master's because they have you know, more education, right? In other words, they are not really equal, but if things were equal, that's how it would be. So where does this expression come from? Well, I'm glad you asked that because it comes from Latin. And in Latin, it's ceteris paribus. And it literally means holding other things constant. It's the phrase that's commonly translated into English as all things being equal. Or as we say, all else being equal. Some people say that too, but okay. So suppose you wanted to explain why the price of milk is what it is. And you started to think about it, it becomes apparent that milk costs are influenced by a lot of different things. The availability of cows, the health of the cows, the cost of feeding the cows, the amount of useful land, the cost of possible milk substitutes, the number of milk suppliers, the level of inflation in the economy, consumer preferences, transportation, and so on. So an economist, instead of doing all of that, applies ceteris paribus, all things being equal which essentially says that if all other factors remain constant, a reduction in the supply of cows would cause the price of milk to rise. All things being equal, except that, would cause the price to go up. Okay, is that clear? Yeah, I was afraid of that. Uh, anyway, if, um, if all contributing factors were equal, then this would be the result. So when it comes to God, can we say all things being equal? I thought that would be an interesting question for us to explore today. In our reading this morning from the book of Acts, so we talked about Cornelius. Cornelius was a centurion of what they call the Italian cohort. So he's a Roman, which means he's from Italy. He speaks Latin. He's in Palestine as part of the occupying army. He sends a message to Peter. Peter is never supposed to go and eat with a Gentile. He's never supposed to enter their house, according to Jewish law. Jewish law, if you enter anybody but a Jew's house, you're unclean. You can't even walk in their house. So that's what Peter was when he says, like, oh, you know how it's unlawful and but so from this scripture, we gain an understanding that the gospel was and is for all people, not just Jewish people, for all people. And what does all mean? Do we remember? Come on, Telly, let me hear it. Thank you. I saw you whispering. I said, no, come on, let's hear it. All means all, and that's all that all means. Exactly, equally meant for all, bar none. This explains that when we say God is no respecter of persons, or when we say God shows no partiality, we mean that God will provide every person with the opportunity to receive the blessings available through his plan of salvation. John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus in the gospel of John, said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the whole world. Amen? And in John 3.16, it said, God so loved the what? Just some people? It says world, right? And that word from the Greek is not bios, it's cosmos. It means every created thing. No charge for the Greek lesson. So he gave his only begotten son that all who believe in him shall have everlasting life. All things being equal. In our reading from Galatians this morning, Paul, after talking about how the law of God was in place to teach people before Jesus came, then he said this, therefore, the law has become our disciplinarian to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a disciplinarian. Now we are all sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed themselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, 
male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So according to this scripture, we're all one in Christ Jesus, right? That sounds nice, right? We're all one. In English, that's how it reads. But the word in the Greek is so much deeper. Okay. So that word one in Greek is epiousius. I know, easy for me to say, right? Epiousius. And what it is, is it's a compound word. It's two words. Epi is one word, and usius is another word. Now, the word usius means substance. What something is made of, what something is composed of, the base foundation of what a thing is, substance. The word epi carries a meaning of super or above, like supernatural, above nature, epi. So epi usius. So here's an example of something I'm sure we're familiar with so we can understand about these words. Anybody know what an EpiPen is? Okay. EpiPen has what in it? Epinephrine, right? That's what Epi is short for, epinephrine. Epinephrine is a word that comes from the Greek. Epi, as I said, meaning above. Does anybody know what nephros means? Kidney. Yeah. So epinephrine means above the kidney. And that's where the adrenal gland is that produces epinephrine, also known as adrenaline. It sits right on top of the kidney, above kidney, epinephrine. So that's what these words mean. They're very, once you know, you're like, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, okay. So this word that we translate as one is epiousius, actually super substance or above substance. And that's not all. The inference, grammatically and verb tense speaking in the Greek, in Greek, there are 52 different verb tenses. I mean, literally, it's just the verb tense will tell you how to read the word and, and what it's telling you. So this one, epiousius, the verb tense means that which recurs daily, something that happens every single day. So what Paul is saying here is that in Christ, we have become a supernatural substance in unity with Jesus, and that this recurs every day. Every day you wake up, you are one substance with Jesus, a supernatural substance. Amen? It's new every morning when we wake up. We are in this position of being above or super substance. We are above substance because we are seated in Christ at the right hand of God. As Paul told us in Ephesians 3, 2, he raised us up with him and made us to sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, part of his supernatural being. We are one with Christ, all one. But you see what the clarifying factor is, right? Faith. You have to believe that. You have to believe it's true. All things being equal in faith. So it is clear when it comes to salvation that God shows no partiality, no favoritism. It's open to everyone, right? And he wants us to be the same way in faith. And that's a serious clarifying factor. However, Jesus' brother, James, told us something in his book. My brothers and sisters, do not claim the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ of glory while showing partiality. Hmm. For if a person comes in wearing gold rings and fine clothes, comes into your assembly, that word assembly in Greek is ecclesia, where we get ecclesiastical from, means church. So if somebody in fancy clothes comes into your church, and a poor person comes in wearing dirty clothes, and you take notice of the one wearing the nice clothes and say, hey, have a seat right here in a good place. This is our best pew. And you say to the poor person, hey, you stand over there or sit over here by my footstool. Hmm. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Just as an aside, the word ecclesia is another one of those compound words. And if you translate it literally, it means called out from. 
So the church, us, have been called out from the world and to God. Amen? And as the church, we are not to show favoritism or partiality to anyone. If God doesn't, we shouldn't. Because if we do, as James said, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Judges with evil thoughts. That's deep. A wonderful saint of God sent me something this week. And it was a quote from a lady you may have heard of, Mother Teresa. She said, when you judge people, you have no time to love them. Hmm. Amen all things being equal. I hear you saying, but God judges us. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about that for a minute. First, we are not our own creators. God is our creator, so he alone can judge. And second, his judgment is not based on our value, and it is never on how much he will love us. His judgment is as to whether our lives reflect his intended creation in us. If I might bring you back to last week, that which suits us to a T. Amen? And God's judgment is always righteous. It's not like ours, because ours is polluted by our human nature. God doesn't... God doesn't just show no partiality towards salvation, but he shows it in another way too. Let's look at these quotes. Romans chapter two. There will be affliction and distress for everyone who does evil, both to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, both the Jew first and the Gentile, for God shows no partiality. Colossians 3, for they who do wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which they have done, and that is without partiality. Whew. That's rough. But it's okay, because in Romans chapter 10, it says, there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. Amen. Amen. So it's pretty clear that God shows no partiality, right? But he does. He does show partiality. You ready to hear about how he shows partiality? Okay. Those who walk closely with God are treated differently than others. Hmm. I'll give you a couple of examples. In Genesis chapter 5, and it's mentioned again in Hebrews 11, we read about a man named Enoch. Enoch was the fifth generation from Adam. He walked with God, and he was translated. He was taken to heaven without dying because God took him up, and that was because he walked with God. Notice Genesis 5 and the fifth generation. Does anybody remember what the number five means? God's grace. Abraham was called the friend of God because he was able to speak to God the way we speak to each other. God spoke to Moses face to face, and afterwards, Moses' face would glow from the experience of talking to God. Elijah, the greatest of all the prophets, didn't die. He was taken up to heaven in a fiery chariot. These people were treated differently because their relationship with God was so remarkably different. So God showed partiality to them, maybe even a little favoritism, if you will, because they pressed in and had a greater relationship with God Almighty. And so can we. It's up to us, all things being equal, of course. Imagine having such a close relationship with God that you become a favorite. How beautiful would that be, huh? At the same time, it would be kind of terrifying, though, right? Like, wow, God thinks I'm his favorite. I got, I got to go to Pharaoh now and like throw snakes around and stuff like that, right? I don't know if I want to do all that. Enoch, Moses, and Elijah all went through some stuff. We are told in scripture that, and, and Jalisa and I just read this uh, the other day, 
all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's from the book of Timothy. And all of these guys that I'm talking about were really close to God, but they went through it, as do we. You see, our faithfulness to God gets tested. Is our faith in Christ real? The enemy wants to do that. If you profess Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you say you have faith in him that he's going to do what he told you he's going to do, the enemy is going to go, okay, let me see. What about this? Oh, yeah? What about this? And it's up to us if we say, that's okay. That's all right. Do we trust Jesus in all circumstances of our life, no matter what? Or do we fall apart when bad things happen? Do we forget Christ is there for us to lean on? Do we question that God is even there? Ow, I stepped on my own toes then. Ouch. When someone bugs us and gets on our last nerve, do we respond in kindness and pray for them? Bless your heart. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Even if they give us the Hawaiian good luck sign that only has one finger? Hmm. Do we love them? Or do we judge them? Or do we complain about them? Do we snub them and then justify our disdain for them? Ouch, I stepped on my other foot. Faith in Christ as the Son of God, prophet, miracle worker, and lover of all persons is not just a cushy feeling that we claim to have. You see, faith is not a noun. It is a verb, an action word, an action that we must work out. Paul tells us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And one way we do that is to show God's love through us without showing partiality. God gave us all the opportunity to have salvation through Christ, and he showed no partiality. All have the chance. And we who have taken hold of salvation through Christ have collectively become a supernatural substance, epiousius, called out of the world and to God, the ecclesia, the church. Amen? All things being equal, we are his love here in this world until we are called back home to him. How we live out our faith, meanwhile, well, that's up to us. All things being equal, of course. Amen?